this, this panel uh, is, is looking at the whole issue of how we extend human rights law to the internet. What is the role of governments? How do governments interact with civil society and, and with companies? Uh, what is the future and role of, of multi-stakeholder initiatives in trying to ensure uh, the, that the rights of all internet users are respected and protected around the world? And in, in this uh, world where uh, political and legal jurisdictions are, are a patchwork of, of nations and you have a globally interconnected digital sphere, how do we rec reconcile the two to make sure that really all the rights of everyone on the network are respected, protected, that people's interests and concerns are understood? And, and this is a big challenge, I think, for governance. And there's been a number of sets of principles built, a, a number of initiatives, and we're going to try and dig down a little bit to, to see what's working and what's not and, and why. Um, I'm going to start with Dan, who is going to first give a little dance. No, just kidding. Um, people aren't sleeping yet. Yeah, so. people aren't sleeping yet. Let's see. No, not yet. Um, no, he, I'm actually just going to ask him a question, um, which is that, you know, as we're in this more multi-stakeholder world, um, when you have a situation where, you know, governments have jurisdiction over a particular polity, but they're passing laws that are having an impact on internet users all over the world who aren't able to hold them accountable, uh, companies from all over the world. When is it, when does a government lead? When does a government share power with other stakeholders? When does, when does a government uh, step back and take more of a supporting role and allow other stakeholders to, to lead? How, how do we work this out? Um, so I think uh, in the kind of preview paper, which I'm sure nobody took the time to read online, we were asked to kind of lay out what we were going to say. And one of the things that I, that I had wanted to talk about was kind of the, the phases of this conversation. And I've said earlier today to a couple of friends that I, there have been a number of of gatherings like this, and at each one, different themes kind of emerge, and it's it's reassuring that the the conversation progresses. Many of the things are are the same, but but that the conversation pro progresses and different themes emerge. And um, you know, early on, the early conversations were the the reactions were, "Hey, human rights has relevance to this conversation about the internet." And then there were a set of conversations where both kind of those in favor of openness and and internet freedom, and those who perhaps had views uh, less in favor of that. Um, everybody was trying to respond to the relevance of human rights, and, and there was a lot of rush to create new things, new principles, new um, codes of conduct, etc. And I think that where we are now is in kind of a third phase, which is that um, at least those who are in favor of openness have, have come back to recognize that, um, that old rights and new technologies go together, and that we don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of principles. And um, and that, that the principles that, that we've used to manage policy questions, um, to guide us through policy questions, uh, human rights principles, international human rights norms, uh, apply and can guide us in, in, in our response to new, uh, new technologies as well. I think for governments that means there are kind of a number of things that we can do. First of all, we can walk the walk, we can lead by example, um, and we can engage with other governments to try to encourage them to, to do likewise. We can reinforce other actors who, who are um, advocating and working in this space, reinforce civil society. We can reinforce uh, other actors by making the point about what's at stake in this conversation. Um, there's the, the theme of this conference and many of the comments so far today have pointed out the connection between um, internet freedom, as a, which has been historically conceived as a kind of civil and political rights uh, rooted agenda and development or economic development and ESC rights. And I think, I think that's a good link to make. Um, you know, there's a recent report came out last month uh, by the Boston Consulting Group that, that actually makes a, an argument about the value of the internet economy to the developed world, to the G20 or the developed and developing <coughs> world. That we all, there's, it's often talked about how, oh, if we could only grow like China, if we could only grow like India has in the in the recent years, you know, that would, that's really what we need. Well, the internet economy in the G20 is projected to grow at over eight percent for the next five years. It's going to create 32 mil million jobs in the, in the G20. Um, that's that's 
important to us. And so we have something at stake in the openness as, and, and it's gonna grow even faster in the developing world. So um, making the, reinforcing actors who are engaging here by, by pointing out what's at stake. And then um, I think overall, what kind of the range of things that government should be doing boils down to is one, um, making clear uh, how, how to embed, uh, making, making strong efforts to embed substantive norms, human rights norms, in the way that we approach the internet, in, in the way that governments make policy decisions and that uh, intergovernmental and, and multi-stakeholder conversations uh, talk about the internet. But also being steadfast in our commitment to a procedural norm, which is the multi-stakeholder approach to these issues, which is the, the norm that has governed uh, interactions with the internet so far successfully and that ought to be uh, the, the mode of engagement going forward. And I think, um, so when I think about the US government, one of the things that we're, that we're committed to is that procedural norm of, of multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think it's particularly important in light of the policy dilemmas that people have talked about. I, I think it's important in its own right because I think the conversation should include companies and, and civil society and governments all together. But I think it's for us as governments, you know, the policy dilemmas that present the hard cases, we can't make that case convincingly on our own. We have to have civil society voices, we have to have uh, company voices in that conversation in order for the solutions that, are, that come out at the other end to be seen as legitimate, to be seen as practical, to be seen as in, in, in consistent with the principles that we've committed to. And so I think it's really important uh, to us for a number of reasons to reinforce that procedural norm as well. Thank you very much, Dan. And uh, in my rush to make fun of you earlier, I failed to introduce you properly. <laughs> um, uh, Dan Baer, Deputy <laughs> Assistant Secretary of, of the, the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor at the US State Department. So thank you for that, and we'll have some more follow-up questions. Um, I'm moving on next to Ms. Gayatri Venkateswaran. That's good. Venkateswaran? That's very good. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, Executive Director of the Southeast Asian <coughs> Press Alliance, um, which is uh, for, for those people who work in media and free expression in Southeast Asia, a, a, a voice um, that is quite important in, in Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm wondering if you could elaborate. I mean, Dan was, was talking about, you know, the, the multi-stakeholder relationship that needs to emerge uh, between government and, and the private sector and civil society. And, and I'm wondering, when it comes to internet policy making, you know, communications, regulation in Southeast Asia, um, is civil society able to play the role that it needs to play? And if not, what are, what are the obstacles? I think there are quite a few things, and just taking on from Dan, uh, it's not, the faces are not so clear, uh, you know, the sort of you're moving from one phase to another, actually it's not that clear because I think that a lot of the civil society groups are grappling with some of the very, very foundational, very basic issues about human rights. And, and then now you have to deal with, you know, this sort of new technology. So I think that it's, A, I think it's not so clear, the faces, they're battling with it. Uh, the second one I think is this assumption that we all understand what a multi-stakeholder multi level model is about. I think that the understanding level is very different um, and especially in societies where the states have had no experience and are not really interested in engaging with civil society, this is a very contested issue. So if you look at Southeast Asia, are, is civil society involved? Are they engaged in policy development? I think the answer in a very, very pessimistic way is that it's no. But it doesn't mean that there isn't engagement. I think that it's not effective enough uh, because I think this issue about what do you expect from each stakeholder uh, is very different, that understanding is not there. So um, what I see in Southeast Asia is that you have a very vibrant uh, civil society um, community, but as far as internet policy and regulations are concerned, it's very clear that it's been dominated by the businesses and the state. That's where the power actually sits. Um, it, it's a new sort of uh, movement that's taking place. Okay, I shouldn't even say movement because it's not even well defined. Um, at the moment, I think that we can't really say who the stakeholders are for internet policy, for uh, internet freedom. Who do you talk to uh, if we say we want to convene something in Southeast Asia? I think you were involved in SIPA's uh, internet uh, regulation forums four, four, five years ago, and uh, that was the only I think, attempt that SIPA had in terms of uh, wanting to discuss that. So it's been five years because we've been trying to figure out how the hell do we deal with this issue. Uh, so it's taken some of us a long time to figure out 
what our roles are, how do we actually do a proper engagement, how do we talk to the to the state. So in that sense, it's been, um, I think everyone is carving their territory, Everything, everyone is trying to understand. Um, and uh, the states have been very smart to also take advantage of the fact that we're not really talking uh, among ourselves in civil society as yet. So it's been an advantage for the states, and that's why you see sort of continuing uh, attacks and threats and sort of like coming up with policies that are actually anti-human rights. So I think that is the state now. Uh, it seems a bit pessimistic, but I think that, you know, it's just to put the things on the table that civil society is also grappling with it. How do you bring um, internet rights into, you know, uh, women's rights issues? How do you bring it into poverty? How do you bring it into sort of anti-free uh, trade, you know, globalization issues? So these are things that's going on. But I think that fundamentally it's a, it's a challenge with freedom of expression as well. How do you make freedom of expression relevant to everyone? And that's what we're facing with internet issues as well, internet freedom issues. Yeah. Uh, Nicholas Lundblad, Director of Public Policy at Google, um, another stakeholder, private sector. Um, you know, as you're sort of working on sort of advancing Google's own interests and, and its own sort of policies and, and so on. Of course, companies have long, fairly established ways of interacting with government. Um, but when it comes to interacting with civil society and other stakeholders, I think, you know, especially in the technology in industry and in the internet companies, where you have civil society so dependent on your platforms increasingly for doing what they, they want to do, challenging governments, their relationship with government goes through you to some extent, uh, you being sort of the sector as a whole, and Google. Uh, but uh, so in, in terms of engaging with civil society stakeholders in particular, and in ensuring that, you know, you're understanding their interests and concerns going forward and that, that the internet is evolving in a manner that that is respectful of human rights um, in, in, the, in the broadest sense. Um, what have you learned so far? What are the lessons? Where, where, where do you need to get in, in terms of making sure you're engaging effectively with not just users, but really your constituents in, in yeah. many ways. It's a great question. So I think that one of the things that, that I really have learned and that we have learned at Google is that it's really important to get the numbers. To start thinking about our freedom as something we measure if we want to change, preserve or expand it. So, so one, of the, one of the critical things is really being able to answer questions like how many internet users are actually currently living in countries that partially or completely block the internet. And the answer to that question is, it's about 900 million internet users today. It used to be 650 million internet users uh, when year on year, if you go to the ONI stats, and essentially it means it's a 50% increase in a year. If you look at how many countries censor now, it's 42 as opposed to four if you go back a couple of years, which is an order of magnitude increase. And when we start looking at our own numbers, we find something pretty scary, and that is that we have started to look at user data requests from democratic countries like, you know, UK, US, France, Germany, and we find in a six month on six month period a 30% increase. You know what that means? That means that there's an internet control version of Moore's law. In 18 months, the amount of user requests on the internet doubles. Every 18 months, internet control doubles. So this is in itself quite fascinating. And since we're not talking about numbers, since we're not data-driven enough when we do this, we start out kind of handicapped and blind. And so that's the first thing I think is fundamentally important. Now, we have some numbers, and we are number obsessed, to be honest. We're kind of geeks when it comes to numbers. Uh, but, but we think that those numbers are readily available from other actors too, the most important ones being governments. So, so uh, we believe that the kind of transparency reporting that we're engaging in is actually something that should come from governments, and that would help us all agree on what the state of the internet looks like. So if you think about it, right, a government that reports on the following things, on what restrictions exist on content and communications, on what rules those restrictions are based on and how those rules can be changed, and then quarterly updates with statistics on how it's using the power that we citizens have granted them, would sort of create a common understanding of how this would work. 
This is one of the reasons why a, a ragtag band of uh, internet uh, aficionados this morning released something called the StockholmPrinciples.org, which is essentially a site that sets out the basic rules for how you can do government transparency reporting. And we're encouraging the Swedish government, since they took this initiative, to be the first ones in the world to actually publish such a report, to put it out there and not only sort of review what kind of rules they use to restrict communication and content, but also publish the stats. How many cases of user requests are there? from the Swedish you know, law enforcement agencies. How many cases of, of eavesdropping? How many cases of content removals? And we believe that once you start measuring this and you get a baseline, you can actually start changing it together. That would form a forum for us to engage with government. It would form a forum for us to engage with civil society. And it would create a commonality around which we could gather. And that is essential for us to actually change anything. Because if you don't measure it, however do you know that you actually changed it, right? So we think that the third step here is to take this and actually pour it into a bona fide index. And then we can start using it, like Minister Carlson suggesting. If you want to have conditionality in development and aid, you suddenly have a number to discuss. If you want to sort of have export control, you have a number to discuss. And it might seem trite to reduce something so important at internet freedom to a number, but honestly, I think we need to start measuring this in order to understand what's happening. Not least because it's getting worse. If you really believe the numbers and the numbers we see, it means that in every 18 months, the, the internet control, internet control generally doubles. So the answer to your question, I think, is let's get that commonality. Let's gather around that and let's make sure that we continue all of the dialogues we have. And beyond that, we need to listen to and be open and inclusive and bring all kinds of civil society and governments to us. And we do our best there, but we can definitely do better. And I, I, I think that, that uh, you know, just that starting point, getting a commonality in some kind of measurement is crucially important. That's great. I know exactly what tough question I'm going to ask Dan later. <laughs> he probably knows it too. I could uh, hear but your I brain. will move on. Yeah, you can hear me. Th you know, yeah, he reads my mind. That's you know, the U.S. government people. They they read your mind. I intercept. Too. I intercepted uh, your mind. <laughs> they, they can yeah, publish he's got a that new transparency. Device, though, you know? yeah. uh, no, but anyway. We'll get, we'll get there in a, in a little bit. Um, but uh, moving on uh, to Rosabel Kagomire, a journalist and blogger uh, for a number of outlets, including Global Voices. Yay. Um, and so I'd, I'd like to ask you about your perspective, coming from civil society, citizen media journalism in Uganda. Do you believe that African internet users' rights and concerns um, are adequately considered in all these conversations about internet governance, principles, norms, and so on? And uh, if, if they're not being ag adequately considered, what do we need to do? Um, thank you. I don't think that uh, these rights are considered because when you come to many African countries, you you see that there's a marriage between business and politics that you'll find uh, ISPCs are the same. You have board members who are in the government, so they can do whatever they want uh, with the government and the business itself. So we have um, rights issues that, uh, for example, in Uganda, we had last year an event where the government issued a directive to uh, ISPCs to stop uh, to put down Twitter and Facebook and this was going to happen but uh, somehow someone leaked information and everybody knew about it so it's very it's very worrying in terms of uh, user rights and I don't believe that in places where uh, rights offline are not respected then we can find governments respecting online uh, rights of users um, in Uganda, also uh, another case is where you have vague uh, laws that uh, uh, um, give government a leeway to, to clamp down on freedom of expression. Uh, just today, uh, a friend of mine was uh, summoned by the police because there is, uh, we have a law that gives uh, the Attorney General powers to outlaw any group that 
um, he considers it's, uh, it's, it's inciting violence. So there's one group that has been staging protests and uh, challenging the regime, which is activists for change. It was outlawed last, uh, a few weeks ago. So the journalist had a conversation with the, uh, an interview with the head of the group. And such laws actually extend to online and offline to journalists that if you're actually having a conversation with that person, then you're inciting violence yourself uh, beyond that person. So th those are vague laws that are inhibiting freedom of expression. Then we have other laws like terrorism in Uganda and, but, and also Ethiopia has been on the spotlight for using terrorism to curtail freedom of expression. So if you're curtailing freedom of expression uh, offline, then I don't expect a government to, ha to actually even think of a user's rights. Um, we have a couple of uh, cyber laws, but uh, the government also lacks capacity when they are framing these laws, they rely so much on uh, ISPCs, which are not necessarily working in the interest of, uh, of the public, and there is little public engagement when it comes to, to, to these laws, for sure. Yeah. I've got a number of follow-up questions to ask you later, um, and I'm sure other people will, will have questions as well, but uh, I'd like to mo move on. Um, at the moment to Mr. David Kramer, who's president of Freedom House, which among the many things that his organization does is, is to publish a, a yearly index on freedom in the world, levels of freedom in the world, and, and also freedom on the internet, um, ranking different countries. And that's proving to be, I think, a useful tool uh, for civil society and, and policymakers and for companies to, to try and work out, you know, what's going on, you know, part of this whole metrics uh, question. Um, and you've written uh, about the fact uh, that while the democratic West is uh, devoting a lot of uh, a diplomatic effort and tax dollars to promoting internet freedom and internet freedom agenda and tools and, and so on, um, the Western democracies have failed to address the, the central problem uh, that it's the West that's the source of the world's most sophisticated surveillance and censorship technologies and, and, and this whole issue of what is it going to take to deal with the problem at its source? Well, Rebecca, first, thanks very much. And thanks to our Swedish hosts for having this conference and inviting uh, me and my colleagues from Freedom House. Uh, my three colleagues who are here are much more expert on this issue than I am, but you're stuck with me up here on the stage. Um, we, as you mentioned, we do produce the report, Freedom on the Net, which I think is a very important tool to study the state of internet freedom. Uh, we also do programming to help internet freedom activists and bloggers with safety and other steps that they need to take in order to pursue their activities without putting themselves in grave danger. Um, I, I think it is important, you also mentioned our Freedom in the World report, and I think that's important because it, what we have to understand, as, as a number of other speakers have mentioned already at the conference, to look at this in the con broader context. This is about freedom of speech, freedom of expression, association, assembly, the right to information. Um, and I think our, our reports and analysis show that in countries where there are broader trends cramping down on general freedoms, we also see freedom on the net at, at risk and danger. Sometimes the governments are slower in moving a, a, against freedom on the internet because it's a little harder to do than going after newspapers or TV stations, radio stations. But the trends do show that with crackdowns on other rights, we will see these kinds of repressive regimes move after uh, internet freedom as well. In, in terms of uh, facilitating their efforts to do that, as you rightly pointed out, there has been uh, a series of unfortunate developments with uh, Western companies providing surveillance and censorship technologies to uh, repressive regimes, helping them go after activists and cracking down on the internet. Um, and that is something, despite, I think, very good efforts and initiatives, uh, GNI and, and others, to try to rein that in, it still hasn't done the trick, in part because some of the companies involved in this aren't members of, say, GNI. Um, and as a result of that, there has been legislation put forward in the U.S. Congress by Congressman Chris Smith um, on uh, uh, internet freedom, freedom on the net, um, and this would... Uh, impose a, a, a ban on exports of censorship and surveillance technology by companies to repressive regimes, regimes that are deemed to be cracking down on their societies. I would argue, and I think my colleagues would as well, my colleagues at Freedom House, 
would argue that we probably do need this kind of legislative mechanism um, because the companies, most are uh, well-meaning, but unless they're forced to uh, follow a ban, they won't. They'll simply go with the profit. Um, I've heard uh, one company official not here um, say that they are responsible to shareholders. They're not responsible to human rights activists or digital activists. Well, actually, they do have an obligation to abide by human rights norms and standards. And if they won't do that on, on their own, then I think it is actually important to uh, require it through legislative means. Thanks. Now I'm going to come to you with my follow-up question. I, I may ask one other follow-up question to uh, maybe one other member of the panel, and then we're, we're going to want to open it up to questions. But I, I do want to follow up with Dan um, uh, on what Nicholas uh, was just raising uh, about the need for government transparency in its requests and demands that, that government is making to companies for user information, for takedowns, but particularly when it comes to the United States, it has to do with the requests for information made by uh, various uh, US government agencies of, of companies and a great deal of secrecy uh, around the requests being made. Um, and of course, the State Department has been doing a lot of good work, working very hard to promote internet openness and freedom and to get governments sort of behind this. But if, if, uh, if the US government were to sign on to the Stockholm Principles and commit to transparency in US government agency requests uh, made to various companies operating in the United States, of course, it's not just the State Department calling the shots there. You have to get the Department of Justice on board and the Department of Homeland Security and the National Security Agency and you know, God knows who else. Uh, and, and so I guess the question is, is, is something like that ever gonna be possible for the, for the US government to sign on to? Is, would it be possible for the US government to make such a transparency commitment given the extent of secrecy that we're seeing um, and, and opacity that we're seeing in the way in which, in which requests are being made of U.S. companies and the laws around these requests making it, you know, so that basi basically it's, it's very difficult uh, for companies even to admit that this is going on. Um, how, how do we address this problem? Well, I mean, I guess to start with, I think, I, I don't think it's, I think the laws that make possible such requests are actually more transparent in the United States than in many places around the world. You can, you can, it is possible to answer which authorities, which parts of which agencies would make such requests, for what purposes, who would adjudicate them, et cetera, even if the, trans, if, if the requests themselves aren't publicized. Um, second of all, I think Google uh, has actually made a contribution to the data around this for everybody and for many countries by by publishing themselves uh, on a quarterly basis. I think the the data behind requests and so some of that data is actually already available and and I would point to the fact that the United States, like unlike some other governments, doesn't block that data from being released, etc. And so it, in that sense, to the extent that others are providing data, um, uh, you know. It, some of it is available. Um, you're right that there would be a practical challenge in terms of probably not only a uh, variety of federal agencies, but also state authorities, et cetera, and, or, or state authorities making requests. And so, you know, I don't know how long it would, um, any interagency process takes a very long time in the US government, and I don't know how long it would take. I think that, you know, um, in, in principle, there's a difference between, uh, between governments who are in good faith trying to figure out how best to uh, manage the obligations that they have to citizens in a responsive way, et cetera, and, and for whom these, there are a set of practical challenges, and governments who see the internet itself as a threat to, to what is an illegitimate uh, basis of power in the view of many of their citizens. And I think, you know, the U.S. falls squarely into the former camp, and 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 ideas like this can be brought up and discussed, and I imagine um, will be discussed uh, and have you know this is the first time I've heard 
the, the Stockholm principles, but I mean, it wouldn't be uh, surprising to me that we end up having several conversations with civil society in the coming months about what part of them could work and how and, and what, what would the process be and what are the alternative mechanisms for getting information out to citizens that is interesting. Uh, President Obama has made a, uh, a, a, a broad-based commitment to increasing government transparency. And so in principle, there's not an objection to trying to make sure that we are being as clear as possible about what the end purpose is and what the v various uh, reasons are that we might make uh, such requests. And I think it's uh, it's worth continuing to dis discuss in a multi-stakeholder kind of uh, environment. And and I would say that you know we do go a good deal further than uh, we don't. We're not starting from zero. Rosabelle, I want to ask you one question, then I'm going to open it up. Um, if, if civil society isn't getting heard by your local governments, by, by your national level government, um, would it be more helpful if either other governments or international bodies and companies were spending more time listening to you? Is, is there a way to... It, I wouldn't say circumvent, but sort of appeal to a broader international community and participate in broader global processes with, you know, a, an array of governments and, and companies if you're not getting anywhere with your own national government. Is, is, do you think that's an option? Yes, it is, but uh, I must say that uh, there's some work by civil society organizations in Uganda, but we still have like uh, limited research and, and uh, in terms of capacity. But there are those challenges, but there is there's still some uh, uh, local organizations that uh, have picked up the issue of, uh, human, of human rights and freedom on the internet. And uh, on the continent, uh, on the African continent, there's the African Commission on Human Rights, Human and People's Rights, and it has taken over this issue as an issue. And this has been an area where different African activists have been engaging governments. So they are on the continent, even within the uh, the country, there are certain. Um, areas where we can engage. It's not. It's not all bleak. So uh, on the continent itself, there's uh, this um, kind of discussions taking place. And nonetheless, uh, the more you have a more transparent uh, system outside in different countries, especially where these uh, where these uh, um, ISPs come from, uh, then the more it it, it it will benefit people on the ground in countries where probably people don't have enough rights to engage. Right. So we're going to open it up. Uh, I, uh, Wolfgang, I think you're the first hand that I saw. And then I saw that hand, and then I saw that hand. So maybe we can get the mics making their... Yeah, and I see you and you. I'll try and get people and, and you. A, a rough order, but we'll, we'll get the mics to the Very first kind. two. And while we're getting the mics to our questioners, let's just turn to our curators briefly to see if we have anything particularly interesting, which I imagine we do. Yeah, thank you for a very interesting Thanks. panel. I, I think the Twitter feed is quite happy with the panel so long. Uh, first of all, people are very happy about the number geekiness. Uh, more data is needed to verify the actual state of internet freedom. So data collection is actually uh, encouraged. Uh, but something that has been discussed is the multi-stakeholder pers perspective that is uh, also discussed on stage. And two questions. First, who is really in to be included in such a multi-stakeholder perspective to make it for first uh, A, progressive and B, maybe even working. Uh, and two, the people are afraid that the current distance between, uh, for instance, corporations and end users, which in this case could be human rights activists, is still too, too wide. So how to actually see the, the process and the results further down the chain, so to speak. Okay. Would anyone in particular like to tackle that? Can I, can I, sure. can I just real quickly? I think that, uh, we can toss around definitions for multi-stakeholder approaches. Um, it is kind of, you know it when you see it. And I think one of the successes is the, the norm that has emerged that if this were a panel about um, embedding human rights norms in terms of the internet and it included only government representatives, everybody in this audience would say this is a very weird panel because we've become so accustomed to the fact that it shouldn't be only governments who are at the table. And there are some governments in the world who are trying to make sure that this, uh, trying to, to 
bring this conversation into a government only realm. And so um, we can define it in some sense by what it's not. It's not a one sector only conversation. And, and we recognize sincere exchanges between corporate sector, civil society and governments when we see them. And, and, and it's something that has been part of the history of the internet and should be part of the productive future of it. Yeah. yeah, I think that what is important is that there are some countries where they do this process very well in terms of, you know, having the engagement process with the state, with the businesses, with the civil society. And I think that sharing of that best, best practices would be very, very relevant for the region. So I think in Southeast Asia, we have some countries where, you know, from uh, sort of looking at human rights, uh, looking at, you know, women's rights issues, I think there have been very successful um, cases of broad, you know, level of engagement. And I think it's very important for us, if we have that capacity to actually share those practices and say this is how you should do it and, and share within the region. I, I had a question uh, maybe to, to Nicholas if, if that's okay. Um, I think having index indices are, are very useful, particularly for civil society to use for, for advocacy. But I'll come to like Freedom House indices for RSF. If you have this index for, you know, um, looking at the level of transparency, um, when you already have states that are resistant to being shamed uh, through numbers, how then can you turn that process and say then it becomes more of an encouragement rather than, you know, to immediately dismiss it and say that, you know, this is just another number, you know, you don't understand our context, our cultural needs, you know, that's something they always throw to you. Um, so, uh, not to you personally, but I mean that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's where the, the, the problem is. So, how do you turn that around and say that, you know, this is what is, is relevant for, for, for citizens? Yeah. It's an interesting question, right? And so it's, it's um, if you look at the world of indices, which is a pretty nerdy world, you find that there are actually <laughs> lots of indices out there already that are accepted by, by everyone. So, so one example of this is that the intellectual property uh, rights uh, community has a lot of indices that they use for, for example, uh, labeling different countries in different categories for trade. So what they've then done is that they've been able to get this through because it's been a part of the trade dialogue. It's been a part of all kinds of different dialogues, and it's been it's been universally agreed on because it's thought to be important. And I would say that freedom of expression is recently, or net freedom is recently, even more important. So it also is a matter of equality that everybody needs to fess up to the same numbers. It's not about shaming somebody and saying you're bad. It's about actually making sure that everybody conforms to the same standard and the same standard numbers. And I think that's something that you can actually, it's going to take time, certainly. Lots of countries are going to prohibit it because just as Dan rightly pointed out, the, the, there are com countries out there that won't even allow us to report on the number of government requests we get, where it's illegal to actually report even on the number, on the volume, right? But the only way to change that is to establish that common standard and drive it, you know, year after year, month after month, day after day, until you actually agree on it. And it's been done. It's been done for intellectual property. It's been done for several other factors. There are lots of different indices out there that are global. It should not be impossible. It should not be... Th this is not so different as to make it impossible, is my belief. I'd also like to comment on the question of the distance between users and, uh, in this case, human rights activists and companies. I think that's true. I think we need to find ways to bridge that distance. It's, it's, a, it's a tricky problem. Many of the internet companies, if you look at them, grow really quickly. And their user base grows by orders of magnitude quicker. So in order to have any kind of user interaction, you need to really structure yourself around that. And I think we have a lot left to learn in this very you know, important and fairly complicated area. So yeah. it's, it's not as if we're there yet. We're, we're trying different things out and we're experimenting. And we really believe that it's important, but we're definitely not there yet. So that's a, that's completely accurate in terms yeah. of criticism. Yeah, no, it's it's really interesting. Just I, I think we're really in new territory figuring out how kind of users and constituencies can effectively engage with companies about their concerns and how companies can effectively engage in, in, in the other direction. And, and I think there needs to be innovation, I think, on all sides, perhaps, in, in, in that regard. But David, you had something yeah, you want to say, and then, then we need to get to Just very quickly to build on what Dan was saying. Um, I worked in the government for eight years and am now back out of the government and still recovering. Um, <laughs> but um, I, So that's were, what it looks like? <laughs> <laughs> oh. right. I, had more, I had more hair. Right. Thank you, Dan. Uh, um, what I was going to say is, when in my experience, there were two other areas in human rights where I thought civil society and governments worked quite closely together. 
but they were smaller communities in the trafficking in persons uh, field. Uh, it's a fairly small community, but a very vocal and active one. The other, I would say, is in religious freedom, where you also have very vocal activists. But I, uh, my sense is um, that when it comes to internet freedom, there is perhaps as, as good interaction between governments and corporations and civil society as on anything else, recognizing that um, governments often want to decide things on their own. Uh, we, we did when I was in the government. I'm sure that still is a tendency that remains as a leftover from when I was there. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So Wolfgang, you've been waiting patiently. Please do identify yourself. I think they'll just turn it on for well, you. My name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm uh, from the University of Aarhus in Denmark, and I'm involved in this internet governance um, field since um, two decades. Uh, I'm very pleased to hear that this um, multi-stakeholderism gets such a support, and I'm also agree with Stan that there is no need to reinvent the wheel because we have already, in particular in human rights, all the principles on the table. However, the reality is that last year we saw a growing number of initiatives for, towards principles for the internet, including initiative by the US government in the OECD to draft principles for internet policy making. And this is my concrete question, why we hear a lot of lip service to the multi-stakeholder principle. If it comes to the point which was raised by Rebecca in the be beginning about power sharing, then it gets difficult, you know. The uh, OECD has opened the door to, uh, as a non-governmental stakeholder, so OECD is an intergovernmental organization, so in the Seoul meetings they have established a civil society advisory board, and then in the process of the making of the principles in the OECD, the civil society advisory board disagreed with what the government proposed, in particular in two points, the role of intermediaries and intellectual property. So, and what happened then, you know, say, Civil Society Advisory Board did not support it. The government adopted the document, and when David Weitzer wrote an article in the Washington Post, he ignored the, uh, let's say, the disagreement of the civil society. So that is really a question if we go down from the nice speeches about multi-stakeholderism to the reality then, you know, what would be then the real practical procedure, how we get really a consensus among the various stakeholders? Remains the decision-making capacity in the hands of the governments only, or do we see a sharing also of decision-making capacity among the various stakeholders? I think um, in the Council of Europe, we had a similar initiative on principle, so we tried to avoid such a, such a conflict between the various uh, um, uh, stakeholders stakeholders, and, but we came to the conclusion that it's not enough to have an intergovernmental declaration of principles, we should have a multi-stakeholder framework of commitments where also commitments to human rights are coming not only from the governments, but you know from private sector like Google and Facebook, from a technical community like ICANN and IETF, and from civil society organizations so that they commit themselves to respect certain principles. I think this would be probably an innovation, Rebecca has asked a question for innovation, you know, that we have a new approach to global framework making, uh, which goes then out of the hand of governments, but this would mean sharing of power, and this is my question to then, whether uh, U.S. government and other governments, how he thinks about it, would be ready to share this. And the question to Niklas, you know, would Google or other private companies, you know, also to commit themselves to respect this? You know, the argument was used, we are accountable to our shareholders, so we have no obligation <laughs> to follow human rights. But uh, such a framework of commitment could change this a little bit. Thank you. Great questions. So. Two, two, two brief reactions. One. Um, uh, I, I, I know the history of the OECD uh, policy, uh, internet principles for internet policy uh, process, and I know that there were disagreements there, and, and I, I, I take your point about uh, real world situations like that force us to, to articulate what exactly we mean by multi-stakeholder. And, um, you know, I think um, two things there. One, being, being committed to a multi-stakeholder process is something that numerous U.S. officials have, have said uh, numerous times, I think we're on record clearly as uh, to being committed to cons consulting with uh, with civil society, with with business, etc. And so I think you can count on that being continuing to be a modus operandi. Does that mean that we will always take a vote at the end of the consultation? No, we don't do that in 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 many fora. But it does mean that when we choose to move forward, knowing that there are disagreements, that those disagreements may continue to be points of discussion. It also 
could mean that it informs disagreements in one context inform the way we speak in another one. So uh, President Obama's international strategy for cyberspace, which came out later, clearly uh, laid out the fact that we don't think that the intermediaries ought to be forced to shoulder burden. We shouldn't be pushing problems down onto intermediaries. Um, it's, it's not clear where one conversation stops informing the next, et cetera. So I, I, I don't think it's fair to say that um, necessarily we haven't substantively responded in other fora to some of the concerns that were raised there. Um, second part, in terms of, um, uh, this is the second time today that I've heard um, a suggestion that could be interpreted as a need to outline responsibilities for civil society. Um, and and I, I would guess that yours is not, uh, your suggestion is not um, ill-intentioned, but I, I get very nervous when people suggest that because it, it, it suggests that there's a problem with civil society misbehaving in some way. And um, most of the actors that suggest codes of conduct or articulating responsibilities of civil society are not those who most sincerely want to engage with civil society. And so I think it's important to be aware of um, well-intentioned uh, suggestions being being hijacked in, in that respect. So I, I'm perfectly comfortable with, with continuing to reiterate a US uh, commitment to multi-stakeholder engagement. I'm, I'm comfortable with uh, saying that we support companies who, who choose to, to join initiatives like uh, the GNI and to make public their commitments to, to certain principles. Um, uh, civil society, I, I'm perfectly comfortable saying that uh, we will continue to support freedom of association and assembly and freedom of expression around the world, and, and that's, that's where I am on, on that one. Yes. Sure. To be clear, Google was not the company that David cited uh, on the, right. the shareholder quote. Um, right. De definitely. So, so the, the, um, I think the question is an interesting one for several different reasons. We've committed to a multi-stakeholder model of sorts in GNI, where we're trying to sort out exactly how that works. But committing to a multi-stakeholder model in a larger format requires a bit of understanding of how that process looks. Many multi-stakeholder process, uh, processes are actually uh, ongoing negotiations, much like you know was pointed out by Dan. And I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. Un less they just become negotiations. They need to have real effect too. And that's a, that's a bit of a new challenge to us if you look at it as a governance model and a philosophy of governance. Finding out how you can have a multi-stakeholder process that also along the way results in consensus that is implemented as policy and at least binding to a certain extent for the participants in that multi-stakeholder process. And the true answer to that is we've never done that before. We've never tried that before, and that's an in terms of institutional innovation, that's something we really need to do. We've seen it work on a standards level, where it, which is sort of, you can, you can view that as a generalization or a simplification of, of all of the difficult rulemaking we need to do in society. If you look at the IETF, they have this principle of you know, rough consensus and running code. It's really difficult to see how you translate that into the policy sphere where there are other fundamental values. Uh, at stake and how you do that. And I think that's something we need to explore together. We've, we've tried to explore it in the GNI format. We're more than happy to try to explore it in other formats too. But it's going to be difficult because I think it's really hard to commit just to a process without understanding where it ends or how it decides or who is a part of it. So there's a bit of institution innovation left to do there, which, are, which is kind of exciting actually because it's a new way of governance. Before we move to the next question, who is back there, since we're talking about multi-stakeholderism, uh, I'm going to ask our two representatives from civil society uh, if, if there's anything you'd like to, to add or respond to. <laughs> Not really. I think we should just... Okay, move on. Uh, so there's a woman there in the back with the microphone. Please identify yourself. Uh, Susan Aronson from George Washington University. Hi. Um, this is a question for everybody but Dan. And that is, you know, um, my research looks at trade agreements and human rights. And the United States has actually put through one trade agreement already, which has free flow of information in it, but it's no way linked to the GNI. And I was wondering if the civil society activists could comment on that strategy. Right now, the US is actually negotiating free flow of information principles as part of the, something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And do you think it could be a good idea, maybe even at the WTO, to have these broad principles relating to the free flow of information, um, coupled with, you know, <laughs> maybe you can't have a requirement, but some sort of incentive for um, related parties to join the GNI. And in so doing, uh, we'd be bolstering the GNI. 
So I'm wondering what the activists think of that. These principles have come about um, at the behest of mainly Google, but also other companies. So they've been kind of a force for good, and I wonder what you think about that. It's interesting. Um, just, a, just a quick footnote there, since I'm on the board of GNI, and, um, and and about the sort of the, the issues of laws and trade agreements and incentives. Um, the Global Online Freedom Act, which is the, the bill that that you referred to, one of its one part of it basically seeks to require companies that are listed in the United States publicly traded yeah. that are publicly traded exactly. Uh, would be required to report uh, to the Securities Exchange Commission, you know, what, what they're doing about human rights assessments, it, you know, to sort of be transparent about their relationships with, with governments, um, or join the GNI, basically, and, and be part of, of a multi-stakeholder accountability mechanism that would evaluate whether or not they're living up to basic um, uh, human rights standards. Um, and that's, of course, it's a national level of law, and it's not clear whether that's going to pass. Um, it's an interesting question whether you could have similar sort of trans essentially transparency and accountability requirements um, that would be part of uh, of trade agreements and, and memberships and so on, which is, which is very interesting. She was saying something. I'm sorry? She was adding. Corporate social responsibility in, in labor and environment. You know, so it's just a new, a new way to think about, I know human rights activists don't like trade agreements so much, but it could be a very positive way to tear down barriers to yeah. free flow of information by, you know, at the same time expanding trade. And again, the U.S. is, is negotiating this right now through the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is Mexico, Vietnam. Yeah, which you know. free expression advocates really don't like because right. it's seeking to but impose greater liability on intermediaries. Well, that's right, the, so right. the SOPA PIPA side. But, they, but they're not really aware of the free flow of information mm -hmm. side. And I wonder if Google yeah. could go out and talk a little bit more about that. OK, well, <laughs> let's uh, see what our panel has to say. Is that me? No? <laughs> well, she asked what Google has to say, so uh, we'll start yeah. with you. So, sure, I mean, uh, really briefly, because uh, I am definitely uh, not the expert on, on trade law and, and, and neither this panel nor, nor elsewhere. I think that the, it's it really interesting to think about what it would mean if this migrates into the trade law framework, and there could definitely be good effects. That said, trade agreements are hairy things, and to understand them in full is really difficult. And so I think that... that um, as Susan's probably right. We need to go out and speak more about what we think our vision is for the free flow principles. And I know we've, we've worked pretty pretty hard <coughs> to convince the USTR and, and other actors uh, that it's worthwhile to look into those issues. Now, if you go back and you look at what trade actually did for the internet, and you go back to the 1988, uh, 1980 GATS uh, agreements, for example, is what I think it was, the, was it the fourth additional protocol that opened up telecommunications industries and essentially laid the groundwork for what would eventually become the interconnections that enabled uh, the birth of the modern internet. So, so if you look at trade law historically, it's played an enormous role for the internet. And the question, I guess, is in a certain sense, and, and Susan would be the expert to answer this, is can it play the same role in a second wave that's by also point. enabling internet freedom? And so, so that's a valid question. The, the Aspen Institute is working on something they call the Digital Accords, which sort of starts from that assumption that there is actually a second act for the WTO in internet freedom and, you know, internet governance generally. So, so um, we will make sure that somebody talks more, if that's okay. <laughs> Any of our other panelists, or shall we move on? Next question, let's move on. So, you have a question here, and then I see some of the other people there. Right, John Morrison, Institute for Human Rights and Business. It's, I mean, there are a whole bunch of multi-stakeholder initiatives that the U.S. government is involved in, not just trafficking. I mean, there's, there's about 10 or so. I don't know if we can count them. 
What's unusual in this arena, on this, on, on, on internet, is that the US, I mean, governments don't sit at the table in multi-stakeholder approaches. They sit beside the table, behind the table, they make the table, but they're not at the table. And I wondered, it's a bit like, what, what is the end game, the goal of this? Do we see us arriving at a place where governments are actually sitting at the same table as other stakeholders? Because in most other business sectors, it's very strange to talk about multi-stakeholder approaches that don't involve governments directly as a participant. And when you, um, Nicholas, mention the data part, it makes me think of, if we were talking in the, about data in the mining sector, then we would talk about the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, and we would match the budgets, you know, the revenue from the mining companies against the money received by the government. And there you have government to be business leverage. I don't I mean, in a sense, you're asking for that in terms of intercepts and data requests on the internet. Is it because we're dealing with issues that are so sensitive and because of the libertarianness of what we're talking about that we can't bring governments to the table? Or is that the end goal here? I just wondered what people's thinking on that was. Well, I would point out that, I mean, that some of the multi-stakeholder internet governance processes do involve governance, uh, governments. Um, Global Network Initiative doesn't because of its particular history, which we've talked about in other sessions. But, but I, I don't think that all internet-related multi-stakeholder approaches exclude governments, do they? No, most definitely not, right? The OECD, we just talked about no. that. There is the, you know, the IDF, the UN-related processes. But, um, but I think John's point is right in terms of, you know, I mean, as the government guy, I'll say this, the reason the GNI doesn't include governments is because governments were part of the problem mm -hmm. that the GNI was trying to solve, was to help companies deal with governments when they make them do things. So, um, and, and that seems a perfectly good reason to me to not have governments at the table. I don't think governments are necessary for... The, for the kind of accountability that GNI is seeking to provide. In other contexts, you know, governments are necessarily at the table in multi-stakeholder initiatives. And I mean, the whole, the whole mechanism, the whole tool, the group of tools that are multi-stakeholder initiatives from the voluntary principles to the Kimberley process to um, the new code of conduct for international security, uh, for private security contractors, you know, we're still learning as we go on that and you know this gets back to kind of the question of how do you how do you make something multi-stakeholder and does a multi-stakeholder initiative necessarily entail equal voting etc some of the early ones were set up where everybody around the table got a vote and everybody got a veto and they've been completely paralyzed and so that's been so i think i think um you know i i, I think the way the gni is set up makes sense uh i i don't think that the problems that it's seeking to solve um need governments at the table and and I think that uh, civil society investors and and companies are, are are and academics are playing a productive role together in sorting through those problems together and representing to the outside world what what what's being what's happening at the table in a convincing way can I just add yes, yeah I please. think that the other spectrum is that it's states that are dominating some of the the discussions in some parts of the world that uh, like you point out why can't you get governments in but I think that the other problems that we are facing is that it's yeah. being dominated by states. We're trying to erode that a little bit and get more uh, civil society involved. And uh, I think that you know that's where the gaps are for for some of the for some of the regions. And, and when you talk about WTO, just coming back to the issue of free trade ag agreement, I think the problem is that you know we don't know what is being discussed because um, a lot of these countries don't have access to information laws. You know, civil society can't get information. Journalists cannot get information. So, you know, I think that it's it's this this discussions that are taking place at WTO is so distant from citizen in these countries because we don't have access to information about what's being discussed. So that's one of those issues. Like, is it strategic? It might be strategic, but it's something that is so difficult to achieve because we are battling with very very basic rights issues about access to information. Um, you know, in order to use that to 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 leverage the discussions further. Yeah, and the, the, the conversations behind the Trans-Pacific yeah. Partnerships are yeah. classified, you know. Um, the, the public can't get information, yeah. which is a big problem. So we have a question here, and then I'd like the microphone to come to, to this lady here, by whoever is taking the mics around. I'm Jeremy Zimmerman. I'm the co-founder of La Quadrature du Net, a citizen organization uh, defending freedoms on online. Um, I want the opinion of our honorable panel on this trend I find disturbing of handling um, enforcement mission to uh, private actors, to private companies, uh, in the name of copyright, the so-called cooperation 
in order to take measures to deter further infringement seems to be very fashionable at the time. We've seen that in ACTA that we may hopefully be about to kill in the European Parliament. Uh, we've seen that in SOPA and PIPA in the US. We've seen that in the uh, aforementioned uh, OECD guidelines. It's in the TPPA and so on and so on. So first of all, my view is that it runs counter and to the, the right to a fair trial, which is a fundamental freedom. Uh, those measures can, uh, will inevitably uh, hurt freedom of speech and freedom of communication. Uh, well, Google does it already with its content ID on YouTube, where we have numerous examples of uh, legal and legitimate uh, parodies or uh, creative and original remixes and mashup being taken down without a contradictory audience, without the right to appeal. And this happens already today. So um, isn't that in total contradiction with some uh, cyberspace policy guidelines, etc., and pushing for fundamental freedoms uh, abroad uh, and all over the world? And how, well, what does the panel think about that? Yeah, and this is exactly why, as Wolfgang was saying, the civil society wouldn't wouldn't support the OECD principles. It was concerned for precisely this thing. Um, part of that question was directed to Google, but before we go to Google, at Southeast Asia is a place where pressure on inter intermediaries is also very heavy. We've had very famous cases in Thailand uh, where where people have been going to jail because of comments being posted uh, on the websites that they were hosting and, and this kind of thing. Uh, and I, I, I guess I, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this trend also, you know, not just in the West, but, but in, in Southeast Asia, um, of governments putting responsibility on intermediaries. And from civil society perspective, what needs to be done, both by civil society, but what, what do all the other actors, what can the rest of, uh, of us be helping to do to, to help reverse this trend? We actually have someone in the crowd who could be able to uh, tell life story, so to yeah, speak. Yeah, maybe we can um, hear from her. I think it's really very distressing to see in the region that that's developing as the uh, sort of um, the stopgap measure for the governments to prevent or to, to, to control the ISPs. Um, so there is a need to reform the laws, um, and but it also requires us to understand the dynamics of those laws and how the infrastructure actually works. Um, we are going on this campaign when we don't have enough information ourselves, and I think that that's where you know this the sort of international mobilization, uh, especially in the issue of uh, intermediary liabilities, is very very important. I think we need to connect much more in that, and and that's where I think the involvement of you know, private organizations are also important to make the commitment um, because we need to be able to fight the states that say that, you know, this is ridiculous, it's not the way it should be. Um, so they're, they're, they're buying their time because we are not well equipped and I think that we have to work faster and uh, get more sort of, you know, back up really. Yeah. Anyone else? So you want to respond to this, this issue with YouTube taking down sure. videos that are actually well within uh, their rights to exist? Sure. No, I mean, to be clear, I don't think any company wants to play a regulatory role. I don't think that's what companies want to do. They want to uh, offer services and they want to sort of enable their users to create on their platforms. Now, what happens with content ID is, though, that you, you under the DMCA in the US, you get a notice and takedown structure, which essentially means that you get a notice and if you don't do a counter notice, then the takedown comes. And content ID is one way of sort of enabling that entire system. And you can argue it's a bad system, but then you're essentially arguing it's a bad law. And if you're arguing it's a bad law, it's a question of changing that law and figuring out what that looks like. What Content ID has made possible on the other side is it's made possible for people to not have to stand by the all or nothing model where they take something down or they leave it up, but they can actually monetize the video if they want to. And that might be a good thing or a bad thing. Now, I would hate to think that Content ID takes down what falls within the realm of what is in the US referred to as fair use or exceptions and limitations in Europe. And whenever that happens, we should simply make sure that Content ID more exactly can determine whether or not it falls within that scope or not. And that's not a simple engineering task, though. We have a lot of people working on Content ID, trying, trying to make it better all the time, so that it responds to, to all of the interests of creators and the interests of others in the industry. And we'll get there eventually, I hope. But detecting fair use 
if you just think about the intellectual challenge there, detecting fair use with an algorithmic model, it's really tricky. But that's what we are doing instead of just taking things down, which would have been the alternative under the DMCA. So you have to, you have to sort of understand what the alternative is too. But again, to back up and be really clear, I don't think intermediaries acting or companies acting as enforcers is a good model. Because as you rightly point out, it, it raises a whole host of questions around you know, rule of law, individuals' right to appeal, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's an area where I think we agree. Thank you. We're going to go to you, and then we're going to go to you after she came first. So. Uh, my name is Sonia Kelly, and I work, I work at Freedom House. Uh, I oversee the project called Freedom on the Net that evaluates uh, internet freedom uh, across the world. So when we look at our research, we see several typologies. One is uh, in countries, uh, some of which are very restrictive, but some of which have still not started uh, restricting internet to the same degree uh, as they have traditional media, in part because internet penetration in their countries is still quite lo lo low. Then we see countries uh, that are uh, imposing the same laws that apply offline uh, to the internet. And in democracies, uh, that's actually a positive thing because that means that protections that exist uh, offline are applied online. But then in less democratic countries, that means that restrictions that currently ap apply uh, to the traditional media, they are starting to be applied to the uh, online world as well. And then the third category, interestingly, is that we are seeing more and more countries that are imposing more strict religion restrictions uh, on the uh, online world than what there currently exists uh, uh, in traditional media. So for example, when it comes to tr uh, criminal defamation, we see in places such as Thailand or even in more democratic societies such as Korea, that the penalties for criminal defamation are much more strict uh, when something is written on the internet. I had an opportunity to speak with a number of government officials and usually the argument is this, that uh, when someone writes something on the internet, it has much greater impact and, uh, and it can be read by people in different communities. Uh, it cannot be easily erased. Uh, it essentially goes around the entire world, whereas if something is written in a local paper, that's not uh, necessarily the case and it really uh, becomes known to a much smaller community. So my question is, how do you respond to these government officials? Uh, what do you think is the most effective thing to say? Rosabel, what, what has been your experience in that regard? Um, actually, in Uganda, we have a whole host of uh, laws that are like that, uh, crime, uh, criminal libel, and we have uh, publication of false news, which is, you know, the constitutional court said it's, uh, it's unconstitutional, but it's still there, and we have sedition. So, again, we've been going back back and forth between courts, uh, courts declaring, but then you have a government that does not actually respect court rules so we are we are there journalists and people online journalists are, are charged by the same laws which the constitution says they are not um, they are not uh, uh, legitimate but uh, and the other thing is that all these trials take a long time so they are using the laws they may not necessarily jail this journalist or an online person but they will use these laws as an example to stop other people from um, t t t as an example that this if you do this then we can we can charge you it's a, a sort of uh, used for intimidation uh, it's the same with the, the the law i just talked about where uh, the attorney general has the powers to outlaw any group without consulting anybody and um, and uh, this is a law from the 1950s. It's the same law that was used by colonial powers to actually curtail freedom of expression when people were uprisings against colonial governments. And the same government is using now f uh, against our citizens. So, and uh, we were talking online today that actually if you put a tweet about uh, maybe a picture of, of, of the activities of that organization, you actually you could go to jail for it, for supporting an illegal uh, group in the country. So. There is this back and forth. You have laws. Uh, you have laws that are, are working against you. Then you have constitutional courts that are supposed to be respected, but they are not respected. So it's a continuous process of uh, calling out for the respect of uh, of the court laws. Otherwise, we have no <laughs> other alternative. If the court itself is not respected, then a citizen cannot be respected. Gertrude, have yeah. there been any success stories in your region? 
No, we don't have success stories, <laughs> unfortunately. And, and I think Frank has asked many times, what are the best practices and success stories from the region? It's a, it's a big challenge. I think I shall take that as my challenge for the next few years. But I think that the should do for your question is that um, I think we need to engage or, or, or challenge the governments in terms of talking about what are legitimate limitations in terms of freedom of expression, which they, are, they don't like to, 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 to get into because they lose that uh, discussion. But I think that that's why we need to go into what we should not do is to ask them to prove that this has that impact because then that's where they are very creative to say that, uh, yes, you know, if it's online, this is the kind of impact it has. I think we should not get into that discussion because I think that is not productive at all. Um, so what we're trying to do is, um, is uh, to sort of build up the arguments or, or, or the cases based on what are legitimate limitations, are these actually covered, are there safeguards, uh, judicial safeguards, and I think that's the only way to go because anything beyond that, then they get very creative, it's politically motivated, and, uh, and I think it could actually be counterproductive to the movement itself. So we have a gentleman back here who was uh, ready to go, and then, and then we'll go to the online curators and, the, and then we'll continue on. And somebody could give a mic to this gentleman here, that would be great. Thank you. It has been really a very interesting panel. Um, I'm Silvermaker. I'm from Institute of Human Rights uh, from Estonia. Um, my question is, like, US, US government uh, companies and NGOs like Freedom House have done a lot uh, in promoting freedom of expression in the internet. But today, I see a possibility that US can become the obstacle in near future because of free three reasons. Supporting old understanding of copyright laws, promoting software patents, and its anti-terrorism legislation. If a whole, if a whole world uh, will have the same kind of approach, approaches, I don't, I don't think that we would call internet free nor open. So my question to a panelist is, um, if uh, to see that uh, what is your opinion about US approaches to copyright law, software patents and surveillance methods and how it will influence freedom of internet? All Dan. these three things. Uh, I'm not sure I understood your three uh, issues. Could you uh, say them slowly? Um, the three issues are promoting old understanding of copyright laws, like um, we can talk about ACTA, but also SOPA and uh, PIPA. Also prom promoting software patents. In the US you have software patents. In Europe we some way have, and there is a huge software patents war between what started a year ago between uh, mobile operators. And also using anti-terrorism law for surveillance and um, other methods. Um, and and if, you, if the same approach will be used in all the countries in the world, I like in my opinion, it's a threat for freedom of expression. But what is your opinion? Thank you. Um, um, okay, so uh, a couple things. First of all, um, I think that my colleague Alec made made a very important point this morning, which is that not all laws that get proposed by the U.S. Congress a become law or are supported by the populace or or certainly by the administration, and so. Um, in, in some sense, what you can see with um, the SOPA-PIPA debate was the successful, transparent, multi-stakeholder engagement um, around a question of public policy where actually um, the members of Congress that were behind the legislation um, were, were not able to garner the support among their peers, partly because of citizen-driven activism. And so it, that example to me is actually as much as I understand the concerns that people have about provisions of that. Um, I think the example of how that story unfolded is actually the kind of thing that we'd want to see in more places. Um, in terms of the actual, the approaches to broadly speaking intellectual property, um, I, you know, I can say sincerely that the conversations that we have inside the U.S. government are practical conversations. It's not there's there's no there's no principled um, oh you know intellectual property is more important than freedom of expression. Nobody is sitting at a table saying that. We're trying to figure out a practical way to be able to protect intellectual property, which you know I understand there's a philosophical conversation around how how much protection intellectual property deserves, but. Uh, there is a there is a principled commitment to protecting intellectual property and and the economic benefits of doing that that benefit people our citizens and others around the world by by fostering innovation etc and uh, protecting freedom of expression and that's come from the president on down and so I think there's a difference between 
a set of practical conversations about how can we best do that, and 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 this goes back to the question from from, from the back as well. I mean, uh, I, I agree that inter intermediary liability in terms of forcing ju adjudication by intermediaries is is a is is not the best approach. It is true that to the extent that intermediaries are between are the ones who have to take the step, then they have to be involved in some sense, but, but the, the adjudication seems to me separable. But then there's a the question about how practically can we make that as fine-tuned as possible so that it's not targeting illegitimate, uh, that it's not making uh, targets of things that we don't want to target uh, within a commitment to freedom of expression, that it's only identifying things that ought not be um, uh, uh, shared without uh, without royalty or whatever. Um, so I think there's a set of practical conversations which are quite different from the, again, the, the, uh, another approach to these conversations which is about how to control, really, um, there are two conversations going on. One is about how to, manage, uh, how to respond to the potential of the internet for, for the next five, 10, 15 years, um, how to maximize that potential. And there's a set of practical questions about how to do that. There are a bunch of people who are engaging in good faith around that, uh, around that set of questions. There are others who, are, who see the internet mainly as a threat to, online, uh, to offline uh, structures of governance or hierarchies, as, as Alex said. And, and they're having a very different conversation, and they like to point to examples of the practical conversations in the, in the good faith effort uh, to justify uh, actions that ought not be justified in the bad faith effort. And that's something that we also, I'm not excusing uh, that's something that we also have to keep in mind as we're having these conversations is the role of precedent and what that does uh, around the world. And it is something that's very much in mind. But I think part of the reason we're committed to the multi-stakeholder uh, effort is not only the, the democratic or progressive nature of, of, of that commitment, but also because we believe that those practical solutions that we're trying to identify are more likely to surface uh, from a group of programmers who come from the private sector and a group of activists from from civil society or programmers from civil society, et cetera, than they are from a table uh, full of bureaucrats. So uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't see the U.S. I, I understand the concerns, but I don't see the U.S. approach as um, boding ill for internet freedom in the world. Can, can I just add, uh, uh, to build on Dan's point? As imperfect as the U.S. is, uh, as you said, Dan, there is a transparent process where different legislative initiatives are discussed. Um, there, it's based on rule of law. Uh, I would also be very reluctant to say what we do is going to have a bearing on the repressive regimes around the world that are going to do these things anyway, whether we, we follow these legislative actions or not. Um, we may give them some additional ammunition to provide phony justifications for their actions, but even if we did nothing, they are still going to crack down on, on these fundamental freedoms. I think there's a lot coming from Twitter, and I've been given the five-minute signal, so I'd like to hear briefly from our curators, and we have a gentleman in the queue right there, and that's probably going to be it. So, um, I, I think people are still trying to understand how to how to really deal with this multi-stakeholder uh, participatory uh, participation in, in uh, internet governance uh, how to actually deal with the fact that well intermediaries don't want to enforce the internet but still want to discuss internet governance for instance uh, civil society is called to participate but or to pre to be present at the multi-stakeholder di dialogues, but not to participate, and also how to deal with the governments actually try to use national security interests to govern the internet. I mean, it's, it's difficult difficult questions actually. Yeah, it seems that one of the problems is that our geopolitical and political structures, and economic structures, trade structures are not really equipped to deal with these 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 issues so well. Um, I think what we'll do is we'll go to this gentleman here, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up the discussion. Uh, my name is Shu Chaudhary. I am from India, and I'll speak from experience in India, which may not be correct for the whole world. I thank uh, our colleague from Google for creating such a scary picture that in 18 months uh, everything is doubling. But I want to talk about, uh, in India, internet is the communication platform for rich. We need to fight this out, but how do we fight? Practically, 2% people 
use internet in India and we need to link it with majority poor, then only we can fight. I would like to ask a question that, of course we must raise whatever happening suppressive in internet, but are we not ignoring the communication platform of the poor? I will give two examples, both from India. I don't know how many of you know that India, which is world's biggest democracy, still gets away with no radio. We do not have a radio. Is Radio is just controlled by the state. We can connect internet with radio to reach majority of people. 80% of India lives in half a dollar a day. But there is no voice. On Facebook, a you know, little bit of government is talking about and there are so much noise because we are powerful. With 2% people, I go to so many conferences. But nobody raises why there is no radio. And the second thing, again linking with uh, poor and on internet, VOIP, voice on internet protocol. It's legal for rich. Skype is legal for you and I. But VOIP <coughs> can be linked with telephone, with mobile phone, to make it available to poor. But that is illegal. And I don't see much noise even here. I don't know how many of you know that, that it's called in technical language, PSTN to VOIP switching, that remains illegal. So my question is, how are we going to fight it out if we, it's in India, only 2% powerful people, but raise only our issues and don't raise the issues of the poor? Thank you. Roosevelt, do, would you like, thank you very much. Would you like to address that? I mean, you're from a continent, I, I think, where, where a lot of similar kind of questions and issues are, are obviously shared. Uh, what do you think is the best way forward here? Um, I come from Uganda where less than 4% of 33 million people is accessing the internet. And when you look at the population is that we have 60% of the Ugandan population is below the age of 30. So um, we have an opportunity uh, through mobile technology, as you have said, more youth are online via mobile than owning a computer. So we have to look at... Uh, more available and and most of the energy actually right now is going into mobile uh, technology and many youth developing applications that can apply for the poor for the farmers for 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 people on the street for for more to come and use uh, uh, mobile applications and uh, and access also the internet from there so they may not uh, in, de in developing countries and, and, and these countries, they might not access internet the same way in the developed countries people do. But we have, for sure, have opportunities that are currently going on. And in Uganda, we have seen the, the mobile technology has really helped us uh, to further the access to internet. Any yeah. further comments? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that uh, maybe the way to that, and, and that is not only for India, but I think it's applicable for many parts of the world as well, where we're still battling with the issue of access to the media, um, having marginalized voices being um, heard. And I think that maybe the way is to keep using some of the old models while we talk about innovations, and that is to talk about communication rights uh, in a broader framework uh, that you cannot separate you know, the, the, the sort of access to the media, to information with, uh, you know, from, from the internet uh, discourse. So I think that we, we still need to go back to that old framework of looking at the citizens' rights to information, to access media. And I think that that's, that's the way to go in and to get a bigger ownership or to involve a, the mass in, 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 um, in, in, in that whole human rights framework. So I would say that, you know, e even in Southeast Asia, that, that whole communication rights perspective is still something that is very, very valuable. Um, and then we bring in this new technology, it's still the same things that we're talking about. So I think that it's, it's, it's something that we also see in Southeast Asia that, you know, there are many people who don't have access to radios, not just India. I mean, we don't have community radio in many of the countries in Southeast Asia, for example. And then you talk about access to the internet, it's, it's uh, you know, really a sort of an alien issue for many people living very far from the city. So that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something. Well, I, I, I'm glad I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I I completely agree that that going that using the old methods and also reaffirming again the 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 old the old or timeless principles and and making clear that governments continue to have a responsibility to protect and respect those principles um, is is key. And I think the changes that are happening on the ground really also speak to the need not only to have good numbers about 
what's going wrong or what the, the concer areas of concern, but also to have good numbers about a areas of possibility and potential. Um, you know, between 2005 and 2015, um, in 2005, 70% of the world's internet users were in developed co economies, 30% were in developing. By 2015, those numbers will be reversed and the number of users will be, uh, will be four or five times larger than it was in 2005. The number of mobile users, you know, in, in 2005 there were, I think, 167 million broadband users in the world. They were all fixed line. By 2015, there will be 15 times as many and 80% of them will be mobile. These kinds of things are, are really important shifts that are happening on the ground. And then we need to talk to small business owners, et cetera, in, in all over the world and help make the case to governments that this is really in their interest. All governments care about creating jobs. They know that that's, that's an important part of their uh, re regardless of their theory of governance, they understand that that's an important part of their legitimacy. And, you know, if you look at surveys of small and medium business owners where most jobs are, are, are being created in most parts of the world, uh, they are twice as likely in developing countries as in developed countries to say that restrictions on uh, regulations on communication are a, ham a hindrance to their business. And business, small and medium-sized uh, businesses in developing countries will say that uh, the, the if you look at the growth rates of small and medium enterprises in, in developing countries, they are 22%. The gap is almost 20, is as much as 22% between those that are online and able to, to use the internet to, to, to do their business as those who are offline and, and, and restricted. We need to be able to make the case about the potential of the internet as well as to continue to raise uh, numbers about the concerns that we have about what various actors might be doing. Which brings Can us I back add a to little the, bit? Uh, um, sure. Sure, I wanted to add the fact that uh, even within, when you're looking at the poor, uh the people you'd call the poor, that in Uganda and other developing countries, we are looking at the, the gender divide, that in Uganda, women are less likely to own a phone uh, than a man. And those who own the phone, it's given to them by a man. So the man dictates how the woman is going to uh, use that phone. So even within that, uh, we, we look at other issues of equality and rights uh, still apply, whether it's between the income or between gender, so we still have to pay attention to that. Well, we have run out of time. If, if my bosses here will allow um, me a little, uh, just, uh, just to, to ask Nicholas and David if you have any final concluding thoughts or anything that you've taken from this discussion that you think is important to further explore or address uh, tomorrow. I think the point is well taken. It's, it's, it's important to remember the basic fact that the internet is awesome and that there's a lot of potential and it's really, I mean, it's really going to change things for the better. But that's also exactly the reason to make sure that we don't harm it and that we protect it and we make sure that it remains free. The only thing I would say is it is making repressive regimes nervous and that's a good thing. Well, on that note, to be continued tomorrow and uh, uh, the, there are buses going to the dinner, I think, in approximately an hour. Is that correct? No. Or no, 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>